excuse me. As I said, I'm Pastor Chris. I am glad you are here. You are at Glory Baptist Church, and I think God brought you here for a reason. I think the reason he brought you here today is so that we can grow in faith and uh, hear from the Word of God. And so in that, if you don't have a Bible, we've got some Bibles for you. There's some in the pews. The Welcome Center has some freebies that you can take home. If you need one on your way out, feel free to grab a Bible and take it with you. If you have an iPad or iPhone, feel free to look something up on there. YouVersion is a good app. We're going to be in 2 Kings 4, 1 through 7 primarily today. And this is the third week of a series that I've been preaching on, a series of stories that come from the life of the prophet Elisha. And he spans a little bit of 1 Kings and then on into 2 Kings. And uh, we're in this third week, and if you weren't here for the first week, the first week we talked about killing cows and burning plows, okay? And if you didn't get that, you're going to have to go back and watch it online. Last week, we talked about digging some ditches. Now today, we're going to talk about grabbing some jars. Next week, we're going to talk about getting our edge back as we look at a miraculous story where an axe head falls into a body of water and this amazing thing happens. It begins to float. God uses Elijah to bring it back. But today I hope that my message will will minister to everyone, but especially to those of you who kind of, maybe you feel a little overwhelmed this week, right? Maybe, Maybe you just feel like there's too much going on, but maybe you feel like sometimes that that light at the end of the tunnel is the train that's coming, right? Instead of the way out. And maybe you just feel like you're running out of energy. I mean, not enough time, right? And maybe you feel a little bit low even on faith. And you're just struggling to get by this week. And so I'm praying that this week, this message would minister to you. Uh, that it would minister to you in your time of need. And if you find yourself kind of running on empty today. If you feel like there's just not enough in some area of life. It's my prayer that God would use this message to minister to you in a deep and hopefully life-changing way. So let's dive into our text, and we're going to start with just two verses to begin with to set the context of our story, and then we'll read some more in a little bit. Um, But let's, uh, let's get into the text, let God speak to us. We're going to be in 2 Kings 4, starting with verses 1 and 2. Now here's how this story starts. It says, The wife of a man from the company of prophets cried out to Elisha, Your servant, my husband, is dead, she said. And you know that he revered the Lord, but now his creditor is coming to take my two boys as slaves. So Elisha replied to her, How can I help you? Tell me, what do you have in your house? She responded and said, Your servant has nothing at all. But then she said, But... Hold on. Except there is, a, there is a small jar of oil, right? So let's talk about these two verses because I think there's actually an awful lot in them. The first thing you, you'll notice is we don't know this widow's name. Uh, we don't know who she is absolutely. According to Jewish tradition, many believe that she was actually the wife of the prophet Obadiah. If you don't know who Obadiah was, uh, this will make sense why she was broke because... Um, Obadiah was this prophet who by himself was protecting and paying for the ministry of 50 other prophets. So he was funding their ministries wholly by himself so that when he died, that there would be nothing left, wouldn't come as a surprise then if this is indeed his wife. And so you can picture this at the very least. Here we have the the story of a, a, a widow and... You know, if she's in her mid-30s, early 40s, we don't know exactly, but she has just lost her husband. And in this culture, she has really not a good opportunity, no, no good chances for positive, solid employment. Because in this culture, there weren't many opportunities for women, let alone widowed women, to work outside of the home. So she's in a pretty devastating place in life. She's lost her husband. And now, these creditors have come knocking, right? I don't know if you ever had creditors call or sending you stuff in the mail, and they're persistent folks, right? Uh, you know, they're, 
you, they, get, they just call you all day. They call you all night. And then now there's new laws, I think, in this day and age where they can't do as much as once upon a time. But they used to be able to just call you constantly, call you at work. They'd call your neighbors. They'd call your family. They'd call anybody they could call if they thought they might get you on the phone to try to get you to pay your bill. And the creditors back in those days, I'm sure, were no different. And so these creditors have come knocking, and they're coming after her two sons because legally they can do this. The law said if you can't pay your debts, they can take your sons and make them slaves. And they will have to work until either the debt is paid or until the next year of Jubilee comes, which is a seven-year cycle. Then when that next year of Jubilee comes, they could be released from that debt. So it doesn't get any worse than this, really, humanly speaking, right? She has no hope. No hope for employment. No money saved up. Basically nothing at home. People are coming to take her kids, right? She is at the bottom. What is she going to do? She can't pay her bills. Now she's going to lose her son. And this is something, when I feel this way at least, I try to remember this when I'm encountering some of those problems of life, right? Now, for me, my problems aren't quite at this level. And for most of us, they probably aren't. But still, I get a little worried about things, right? And I get a little worked up about things. And it's, it's amazing how riled up we can get about things that really aren't a big deal, right? This happens to most of us all the time, doesn't it? We get, we get riled up about silly things. My internet is too slow. This is a daily problem for me here at the office. Ruth, Ruth hears my constant complaints. There's nothing we can do about it. But if you live out here, you know what I'm talking about. The internet is slow. It drives me crazy. Or where I used to live, when we used to live in Waseca, the, the, the route that my wife would drive home from school every day for three years, there was a spot on the road guaranteed it would drop her phone call while we were talking. Guaranteed. Drove me nuts. Why can't my phone company fix the tower? Right? I get angry about it. Was it really a big deal? Or, or we get angry like, who ate all my potato chips? Right? Not a big deal. Or we get angry. Somebody left the seat up. Oh, that is a big deal, isn't it? Sorry. Sorry. Didn't, didn't mean to go there. But uh, the reality, though, is some of us today are complaining about entry-level problems like those. But some of us, we've got some graduate-level problems in our lives, don't we? I mean, it could be just we're struggling to get by in our marriage and we can barely get along with that other person. Maybe we've got a kid who's, let's be frank, they've been a knucklehead, right? They've made some bad choices. They're going, a, we can see a trajectory in their life and we don't like where it is heading. They're on a road to some place we don't want them to go. And we're agonizing because we can't necessarily stop them from going there. We can't keep them from hurting themselves or even possibly others sometimes. For some of you, it might be a financial situation. And you're just wondering, how are we going to get out of this? Maybe it's a health situation. Health really stress us out. Maybe the doctor said something to you or to someone you love. And, and if there isn't a miracle from God, you, you don't know what's going to happen, but you're wondering if it's not going to be good. Some of us have some graduate level problems. And if you're in significant need today, I want to give you the key thought for my message that I believe God is going to, to drive home and build our spirits with to help build faith in us. You'll see it at the very top of your sermon notes if you look in your bulletins there. But it's this. Hear these words today. When you don't have what you really want, you will discover that God is what you really need. Let me say that again because I think this is really important. When you don't have what you really want, you will discover that our God, our good God, is what you really do need. Let's unpack this story and let this point come to life for us. You see, this, this woman was in significant need, right? And she expresses it to her prophet. What does the prophet do in the story? Well, let me tell you what he doesn't do first. 
what he doesn't say is, oh man, that sounds like a bad problem. It stinks to be you. Sorry. Right? He doesn't just blow her off. He doesn't just say, oh, that's so, oh, that's too bad. I'm sorry. Right? I'll be thinking about you. You ever get that one? I'll be thinking about you. I'm like, don't think about me. Pray for me. Do something that's useful. Something with power. Thinking? Your thinking's not going to get the job done. Pray for me. I'll take that. Thinking? Keep it. Don't want it. I don't mean to be selfish, but I want something with some power in my life if you're going to do it for me. Don't just think. Pray for me. Do something significant. And that's exactly what the prophet does. Not the prayer specifically, but he does something. Not just intellect in his head, oh, I'll think about it or whatever. No, he makes himself available to her. And we see this in verse 2. These are the words that he says. When she expresses her problem to him, the prophet Elisha says, not, oh, sorry, but he says, how can I help you? Five very simple words. But five potentially life-changing words. When somebody is hurting and suffering or in need, these can be some of the most powerful things you could possibly say. This is exactly what Elisha does. He says to this woman, instead of giving her an answer, instead of saying, here's how you fix your problem, he just simply says, how can I help you? If you, don't, if you want to make a difference in this world, if you want to, your life to begin to be filled with joy, start every day waking up by saying, God, I am available to you here. I, I, I want to be your divine representative wherever I go. Anytime, God, there is a need. Even if I can't directly fill it, Lord, I want to be a conduit to minister to others. And so then, as you go about your day, when somebody at the office says, oh, I've got a problem, you can say, how can I help you? Somebody says, oh, I just, I, I've got this spiking migraine. How can I help you? Maybe you can't, but how can I help you? Or my husband's been driving me just crazy. How can I help you? My kids are going off the deep end. How can I help you? What you say is, how can I help you? And just make yourself available as Christ would. And then the prophet says something to her that, that, that's very profound. It, it respects her dignity. He says to her, tell me, what do you have in your house? Right? I mean, in other words, he doesn't start off with, I'm here and I have all the answers because I'm the prophet and I'm a big deal. No. He respects her and he says, let's start off with what you have and see how God could possibly meet your needs through that. So her reply, as we heard, is she says, I've got nothing at all. Isn't it interesting when you're, you're hurting, when you're suffering, when you're in that dark place, isn't it interesting that when you're lacking, all you can see is what you don't have, right? Right? She's hurting, and all she can see is what she doesn't have, what doesn't, don't, doesn't have at all. She, I, I, I've got nothing. When we're depressed, when we're down, when we're in the hole, when, when spiritually we're beat down, when we're tired and worn out, it's so easy to see what we don't have. I don't have enough. I don't have what I need. I can't do it. I don't have enough money, enough time, enough talent, enough patience. I can't do it. I don't have the right spouse. I don't have the right job. Right? I don't have what I want. So life doesn't matter. It's funny how when you're in need, all you can focus on often is what you don't have. And this is exactly where this poor woman finds herself. She's about to lose everything, and all she can see is her lack. So the question is, what do you do when you don't have much? Well, the answer to that question is, stop waiting for what you want. 
and start to work with what you have. 2 Kings 4.2. He says to her, what do you have in your house? She says, I've got nothing. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's right. I, I do have a small, one little single jar of oil. Olive oil. That's all I have. Just that one thing. Stop waiting for what you want and start working with what you have. You may say, what good is a small jar of olive oil, right? Well, first, olive oil was an incredibly valuable commodity in that day and age. It was fairly rare. It was hard to get, took a lot of work, and had tons of important uses. The oil was, of course, used in cooking as we use it today. That's a good thing. They used it in lamps so you could see at night because they didn't have a current bush they could plug into, so they needed something to be able to see in the dark. And so you could burn olive oil. It was useful for that. You could use it as a, a moisturizer, hand lotion kind of thing. You couldn't go down to Bath and Body Works and get the, the full body coating treatment with all the beautiful stinky smells, right? You couldn't do that. You used olive oil. Everybody smelled like they were Greek. That's what I imagine Greek grandmas all smell like, is olive oil. I don't know. I'm not Greek. But it's a great moisturizer. My wife uses it all the time as a moisturizer, right? So a little squirt on the face, a little behind the ears, all that. You could use it to keep iron from rusting. It's a, it's a good oil for that. It's used to keep leather pliable. Back in those days, that was a, a very important function of olive oil. And then it was used as a an offering, a religious offering to be brought to God. You'd use it to anoint people in worship services. So this little thing that she has, and it's the only thing she says she has, is actually quite valuable. But she doesn't have a lot of it. She only has a little. And personally, I am thankful that we serve a God who specializes in doing a lot with a little. We serve a God who is absolutely capable of doing unimaginably large things with just a little bit. I'm thankful for that, otherwise I wouldn't be of much use. Our God can do infinitely more with very little than we could do if we had it all. You'll see this again and again all throughout Scripture. Again and again, you'll see this. In the New Testament, when Jesus, he was teaching and speaking, and he had taught thousands of people one day. And at the end of the lesson, everybody's hungry, right? And the disciples say, we're out in the middle of nowhere. Jesus, who's going to feed these people? We don't have any food. A little boy comes up. And he could have said, well, I, I don't have much of anything, Right? But I do have a little. The little boy didn't have a lot. He just had a little. And he took all that he had and he said, All I have is five loaves, two fish. And in the hands of the Son of God, that little bit becomes a lot. And it fed the thousands. And in fact, they had a dozen basketfuls of leftover when they were done. Because we serve a God who can do a lot with a little. In the Old Testament, Right? Here's another example. When a whole army of grown men w were afraid of one Philistine man, Goliath. Who stood them down? Who, who did God use in that story, right? A little shepherd boy with a little bit of faith and a couple of little stones. And he goes up and he says, who are you to Goliath? Who are you to come against the armies of the living God? It's said that Goliath was over nine feet tall. Here comes his little shepherd boy. You can just imagine him laughing. Little David says, who do you think you are to come against the armies of God? Everyone thinks you are too big to be beaten. But I think you're too big to miss. And I'm taking you down. That's what David says. And God uses that little boy with a little bit of faith and a little tiny stone to take that big giant down. We serve a God who specializes in doing a lot with a little. 
Jesus said, if you just have the faith of a mustard seed, you could say to that mountain, cast yourself into the sea. And it would happen. Our God can do a lot with a little. So Elisha says, lady, what do you have in your house? So many people will say, we can't because we don't. We can't because we don't, right? And I believe a person of faith says, we can because we don't. Because the limitations we face are often what give us innovation. If we had what we needed, God wouldn't be able to show us what we needed to see. Now the second thought as you're going through your notes that we learn from this awesome story is we're going to offer to God what we have and we're going to trust Him to give us what we need. Offer God what it is that you do have, right? And then at that point, trust Him to give you what you need beyond it. Watch this come true in 2 Kings 4, 3 through 7. Elisha said, after she responds, well, I got the filled jar of oil, right? He says, okay, then here's the deal. He says, ma'am, go around and ask all of your neighbors for their empty jars. Don't ask for just a few. Then he says, Then after you've done this, go inside and shut the door behind you, and you and your sons begin to pour oil into all of the jars. And as each one is filled, put it off to the side. So what's going on here? And he says, go get a bunch of jars, right? All you have is a little bit of olive oil. But if you will trust God, if you will pour out, not only trust God, but pour out what you have. Right? He doesn't say, go sit by the jar. He doesn't say, go pray by the jar. No. He says, go take the one thing that you have and dump it out. Pour it out. Go pour out your oil. But if you trust God and you pour out what you have, and then you put that jar aside, God will refill your jar. He will keep giving you what you need. And you'll be able to keep on pouring. Now, if we were at the circus and we saw a clown, right? And, and, and he, had, he was like squirting water. And that water just kept coming and kept coming. You know, sh- 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 out of his arm or out of a flower. We would think he had some reserve somewhere. Something was supplying it, right? Something was powering that water. The thing is, there was no trick here. This was a ridiculous provision by God. When she had the faith to offer what it was that she had, God would give her what she needed. And that's exactly what happens in verse 5. So she left the prophet Elisha. She went and shut the door behind her and her sons, and then they began to bring the jars to her. And it says they, they, they began bringing jars. And what did she do? The Bible says she kept pouring, right? And when finally she, she pours jar after jar after jar, and finally, at some point, she finally exhausts their supply of jars. It says when all the jars were full, she said to her son, bring me another one. They said, Mom, I'm sorry. Uh, there's no jars left. And it was at that point then that this little tiny jar of oil finally stopped flowing. As long as there was an empty jar, God would fill it. But when there was no more jars, the oil stopped flowing. So at that point, she went and told the the man of God and said, and here's the good news. She went and tells him and, and he says, go then and sell this oil so that you can pay off your debts. Your debt has been paid for. You and your sons, after you sell this oil, can live on what is left. When she offered what little she had, God gave her everything that she needed. As long as there was an empty jar, the oil kept flowing. This was a ridiculous request to ask her to empty out everything, right? And to trust God. To ask her to go to neighbors and collect up some buckets, some pails, whatever they got. If they got got some Tupperware, borrow it. If they got a butter tub, go get it, right? 
Whatever they got, borrow. Go out, knock on your neighbor's door, get whatever jars, whatever pots, whatever you can. Get it and bring it and fill it. And in this, we see amazing faithfulness by God. And I don't know how that will speak to you, but at some point, you will reach a point where you will need to take what you have and stop waiting for what you want, but offer it to God, and then God can do something special. He doesn't say go get a specific color jar. He doesn't say a specific size of jar. He doesn't tell her a specific shape of jar. Could have been any jar. Could have been milk jugs, peanut butter cups, the jugs for peanut butter, whatever. He says, just get it. Doesn't matter. Because our God can use anything. Any size, any shape, any color. It just needs to be empty. So how does this apply to us? Well, in the New Testament, 2 Corinthians 4, 7, it tells us that we, you and me, followers of Christ, we have this treasure which is Christ in clay jars. What is that referring to? You know what that is? That's us. That's our bodies. That's what we are. We are clay pots. That's who we are. And we have this treasure of jars that needs to be filled. What is God looking for, though? We need to empty ourselves. This can be tough. God can't fill us if we already think we're full. But if we will empty ourselves of ourself, if we will empty ourselves of our pride, when we empty ourselves of greed, when we empty ourselves of our own agendas, when we come to God totally empty, then He fills us with oil. And if you don't know, oil has always been a symbol for the Holy Spirit throughout Scripture. And suddenly you realize when you don't have outwardly what it is you want, that it is God who is what you really actually need. And suddenly He is enough. Suddenly He is sufficient in every single way. When you are weak, He is your strength. When you are hurting, He is your comfort. When you're lost, He is your guide. When you are hungry, He is the bread of life that will nourish you. When you are thirsty, He is the living one. When your life is unstable, God is the rock that does not move. And when you realize, I don't have what I wanted, it's only that, that you suddenly discover that He is exactly what you needed. Someone came in today needing to hear this. Someone hopefully came in today feeling like you were on empty. Like you were lacking. You were wondering where the answer is going to come from. How is it going to turn out? Which way is this going to break? Worried about something in this world. Health, finances, relationships, all kinds of things. Stop waiting for what you want. And start working with what you have. Offer God what you have and trust God then to give you what it is you actually need. Because when you don't have what you really want, you will discover that our good God is what you really need. And that is enough. Amen? Let's pray.